Good afternoon and welcome to the Börsen Talk 2021, the first of four webinars organized and brought to you by Six Swiss Exchange. My name is Ander Buck, Global Head of Sales and Relationship Management, and it's my great pleasure to introduce this crypto panel and welcome you wherever you are here with us at Six Swiss Exchange. Before we start the crypto panel, let me introduce you to some feature of this webinar. This webinar will also be recorded and can be watched at the later stage at your own convenience. I also invite you to actively participate. You can submit questions at any time. And we also have prepared one or two polls. And I would be obviously grateful and pleased if you could take part with these polls uh, once uh, showed. To infinity and beyond, this was Buzz Lightyear's call when he jumped full of confidence into the air and no one would have believed it, landed safely next to his new friend, Woody. The film Toy Story showed clearly that belief and determination can make the impossible happen. Cryptocurrencies have now arrived in the financial industry, whether you like it or not. We at SIX welcomed already in 2016, the first tracker certificate on Bitcoin. And with some Buzz Lightyear's loops, have expanded our product range, not yet to infinity, but certainly beyond what everybody believed initially. Let's look at the numbers. Here to date, we have more than 4.6 uh, billion Swiss francs trading turnover, over 160,000 trades, a choice of over 100 products, ETPs and certificates, and 10 cryptocurrencies to choose from. We have so far this year five new ETP crypto issuers uh, listing their products with us. And obviously for me as sales, good to know, more are in the pipeline, more issuers will join Six Swiss Exchange in the coming uh, weeks and months. So it is with no surprise that I'm very pleased that we have some key experts from the crypto industry here on our panel, which contributed enormously to the mentioned numbers. And without further ado, I happily hand over to Mark Titley, our moderator for this afternoon's panel. Thank you, Mark. Over to you. Thank you, Andre. And hello, everyone. And welcome to the kickoff of uh, Six Person Talk 21. My name is Mark Titley. I'm the editor of the market.ch and I have the honor to be the moderator of the first panel discussion. Crypto investments to infinity and beyond or at least to the moon. It's probably fair to say that cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Bitcoin being the largest among them, um, have grown up during the course of the last 18 months or so. Uh, cryptos have become investable, both for retail investors and for institutional investors. There's a futures market and there's even uh, now a micro futures market for smaller transactions. Most of you have seen the meteoric rise in prices last year. You have also seen the volatility in these prices in the past few months. And you have even witnessed the Elon Musk effect in some of the prices in the past few weeks. So what does it all mean for investors? What role can and can't cryptocurrencies play in a portfolio? It is my pleasure to touch on these and many more questions uh, during the next 50 minutes or so. And it's my pleasure to introduce the four panelists to you. I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, first, we have Raphael Huber. He's the head of research at Bitcoin Swiss. Bitcoin Swiss was founded in 2013, and it is Switzerland's oldest regulated professional provider of crypto financial services. Then we have uh, Stefan Caba Ferreiro. He's the head of trading at Goldenberg Hemeyer, a registered market maker and one of the fastest growing liquidity providers specializing in ETFs and ETPs on and off all major European exchanges. Then we have Townsend Lansing. He's the head of products at CoinShares and he's responsible for developing and managing products for the asset management business. And we have Ophelia Snyder. She's the co-founder and president of 21 Shares. 21 Shares creates easy, secure, and regulated ways to access crypto asset classes. 
21 shares listed the world's first crypto index ETP on the Swiss uh, on the on the six Swiss exchange in late 2018. Welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Now, just one word of housekeeping, just to repeat, uh, like Andre said, you can ask questions at any time during our discussion, and you can do that by using the Q&A function at the right side of your screen. I will keep an eye on the questions that are in the room, and I'll do my best to integrate them uh, into our discussion. Now, before we start, I'd like to just feel the room a bit, uh, what your views are. And we have a very, very simple poll prepared for you, um, which is, where will the price of Bitcoin be at the end of this year? You should be seeing this poll in a second. What will the price of Bitcoin be at the end of 2021? And we have four choices here, $4,000, $35,000, which is uh, where we are about today, $65,000, which was the high in uh, early April, I think it was, or $100,000. I'll give you a few seconds to choose. And if you have voted, you see the votes coming in now, and I'll just uh, give it a few more seconds to see how those votes change. Okay, there's, there don't see, seem to be any more coming in. So what we have, 65,000 US dollars, uh, almost 50% of you, 46% uh, of you say 65,000. So you have hopes that you, we will see at least the high, the previous high again by the end of this year. Uh, another 35% uh, said $35,000, which is uh, what we had until a couple of days ago. So we have another poll for you, but we'll do that a bit later in the discussion. Now we'll jump into the discussion. Whenever I talk to investors, whenever I talk to people who are not uh, day in and day out specializing in cryptocurrencies, I, I'm always amazed by um, that, that there isn't really a common view of what cryptocurrencies are. Are they money? Are they a means of exchange? Are they a store of value? Are they just an object of uh, speculation, a speculative asset? Uh, so first, uh, I'd like to hear from each of you what is, and I'll use Bitcoin as, as the largest one for this question, what is Bitcoin to you? Uh, Ophelia, uh, I'd like to start with you. Uh, sure, I, I guess I get the fun of being, being first. Um, it's a really nuanced question. I think limiting it to, to Bitcoin helps with the nuance because I think it really does depend on which assets you're talking about. Um, when I think about crypto assets, I think where people often get tripped up is that it's a little bit of both, which is to some degrees a terrible answer. But I think the idea here is you, it's like the early days of something new. And in the long run, I do believe you'll end up seeing Bitcoin as a store of value. In the short run, it's more like um, being able to invest in an internet protocol. So instead of you know investing in an Amazon or Facebook, it's as if you could actually buy a piece of the HTTP part of it. It's so early still in terms of the evolution of the ecosystem that yes, you're still gonna see volatility, but I think over time you'll see convergence of this thesis. It's the early innings of a new store of value. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Townsend. The accurate way of putting it, I think, um, I mean, it depends on the investor or the, or the person looking at it. I do think, I think the idea of being able to invest early in the internet protocol is a very good analogy. Um, but I also think for, you know, for investors who are looking for kind of short-term volatility. There are many investors who have buckets allocated to that type of risk. It is also a very viable asset class. I do think longer term, you know, if you're looking at 
kind of something competing with or replacing gold for traditional store value hedge of inflation, it will serve that function. I think it even probably serves some of that function now if you, you know, if you're just sitting there worried about fiat currency, which is, you know, something people have been worried about probably since 2008 and many people even not before, you know, traditionally the gold was the only outlet. Um, I think, you know, Bitcoin in particular is 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 competing with that. So I, I do I do agree. It's it's somewhat strange to say it does kind of encompass a lot of different aspects and can be a lot of different things for different investors, depending on their risk reference and their portfolio management style. Thank you. Th uh, thank you, Townsend. Uh, over to you, Stefan. Yeah, perfect. First of all, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's nice to see that zero was not in the poll. It's always good. That used to be one of the options. So nice to know that it's been removed from the table. Um, yeah, from my perspective, I, I definitely agree with, with my fellow panelists. I think we're at the early days. I think to rule it out as a currency, it's probably a bit early because I, I definitely think in its current form, store of value seems to be the go-to. But technology has impressed all of us over the last 20 years. So who's to say they don't figure out a more efficient way of, of reducing transaction costs and transaction time? You know, obviously, we're not going to go too technical, but there are always solutions to the world's difficult problems. So I don't think necessarily currency is off the table. I think where it stands today, I would agree it's probably a store of value in its first case. Um, and yeah, then I think it's it's also a gateway, as Ophelia rightly said, to the rest of the world. So it is kind of like the, the introductory protocol for, for crypto. Hi. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I did see they didn't uh, they didn't uh, um, use five hundred thousand uh, in the poll either. So it was it was quite a narrow poll between yeah. four thousand and a hundred. But you're right; uh, there usually had been in the past at least a zero in these kinds of polls as well. Um, over to you, Raphael. What is Bitcoin for you? Well, to me, uh, Bitcoin, I think, is, is best described in its current form as uh, digital gold. So I pretty much agree uh, with my fellow panelists. And uh, it's probably just a store of value today. Um, and I think it's, the narrative has actually shifted the other way around. So it was first designed to be this peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, transfer cash value transfer protocol. And now um, people started to realize that maybe it's just OK if Bitcoin is digital gold. Maybe that's something useful. Maybe that's something that we need in the digital age. I mean, the, the, this whole transformation into the digital age isn't that old. And uh, Bitcoin, I think, will serve an important role in all of this, it as a store of value. So most of you, are, probably we agree in this round that it's, for now at least, first and foremost, a store of value. It can be seen as a digital gold uh, with a finite supply. Um, whenever we have a uh, mistrust in fiat currencies, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies pop up. Now, one thing that has popped up last year were headlines of institutional investors, mass mutual, for example, or um, old hedge fund investors like Paul Tudor Jones or Stan Druckenmiller publicly saying they buy Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. My question is, and first to you, Stefan, is that more than just anecdotal headlines? Do you see that institutional investors are investing now in numbers? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think I think our personal story at Goldenberg uh, will will kind of give a bit of credence to the argument because we were not that happy to get involved uh, up until this year, and I think what changed for us was the improved custody solutions. So I think. You, you know, it kind of all stumbled around the same time. It's, it's pretty funny how, you know, the market was just recovering from COVID and, you know, we were kind of getting a slowdown and as traders, we were looking forward to a quiet Christmas and then all of a sudden crypto exploded. It's to do with a lot of things, but I think the custody has been a big part of that. And I think obviously we have issuers in the room and, and they see it firsthand. I think it's just, there's been a new avenue, a new way to invest, to bring people confidence. You also have to remember that big firms take a long time to move, right? So if you don't have, if you have a new asset class, you don't have the risk systems for it, you don't have the connectivity for it. The ETP has really allowed every investor to be able to put it in a portfolio and at least see the PNL, right? That's that's where you want to start. So I definitely think the the fundamentals have have been great for institutionals to come on board. 
And from our perspective, um, you know, it's been it's been probably the most traded asset class of the year. So I, I have to say that definitely the, the demand is there. Um, yeah, talking from the volumes that we've seen as a market maker. From the issuers, uh, Ophelia uh, first and then Townsend, what do you see? So I think you really have to start with a definition of what we mean by institutional, um, because I think that means a lot of different things in different markets. Uh, in this market, we have a tendency to talk about institutions as, you know, your, your big hedge funds, your your very large family offices or multifamily offices, um, and, and very significant holders. So I think the part of the institutional market that's a little bit more risk on, um, people like the hedge funds, all the people that you've mentioned, you definitely are seeing more activity from that and you're seeing larger holders of assets come into the space, both in ETPs and I also think broadly across the market. Uh, and I think you'll continue to see that trend growing as people have more tools with which to access the market and quite frankly, also clear regulatory instructions from their, their home jurisdictions. I think the part of the market where I still haven't seen a ton of activity, I and I don't know if maybe anyone, any of the other panelists have seen differently is what I would call the, you know, very, very institutional side of the market, which is going to be, you know, your, your third pillars, your um, retirement plans, your big pension plans, I think they really haven't entered the market yet, at least in a meaningful way. Um, there are certainly places where you can self-direct, but in terms of actually discretionary mandates in that part of the market, I don't see a ton of that yet. Um, and I think that's going to be the next sort of frontier in terms of new institutional entrance in the market. Do you see that as well, Townsend? Would you agree with what... I think that, that's a description. I mean, I think the evolution... I mean, it, I feel like it's right. You have to look at how you define kind of the investor pyramid. I guess um, I'll get to that in a second. I think the evolution has really gone, unlike most asset classes, which start at what we'll call institutional money and then move down to the retail space. It's gone the other way around. I think largely speaking, what's happened recently is, you know, or for years you had retail very much involved in a niche basis, mass market retail adoption. Well, mass market is somewhat, but more mass market retail adoption. Then you had kind of savvy traders at, institutions holding on their PA, trying to convince their risk and compliance that they should buy it at the institutional level. And now I think they're finally getting heard. Um, I think to Ophelia's point, right? I mean, if you define the investor universe, I think the way, way we look at it is at the very bottom, you have retail and advised retail. They're clearly involved. Um, above that, I think you have some of those advisors, IFAs, who in the US are, you know, registered investment advisors are seriously looking at this. You see that type of demand in some of the products. It's also creeping up dramatically in Europe or creeping, incre increasing dramatically in Europe. Above that, you have family offices, private banks. Um, there's a lot of interest there. And then as you get to the more narrow part of that pyramid, which is, as Ophelia said, is multi-asset mutual funds. So, you know, the traditional usage funds. Um, and then even above that, the insurance and, and pension, their slow adoption. I think, you know, a, a provider like Ruffer and their large announcement was, was quite a dramatic um, turn of events in terms of announcement of institutional adoption. It's definitely increasing. I think, you know, even since I've been at CoinShares in 18 months, uh, the amount of institutional query, even if just informational purposes, all the way up the chain, perhaps stopping with insurance and, and pension, although we have some interest, has increased exponentially. Um, the number of calls, requests for research, the, you know, the, 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 the information requests, the engagement has increased. I think the adoption, at least, you know, if you want to compare it to gold and the way gold is kind of sits in those portfolios is still to come. But without a doubt, I think, you know, where people kind of dismissed it earlier, you know, there is no doubt that in the market among the whole investor period, there's interest and there's a willingness to engage. And that goes across, you know, not just the portfolio managers, but also the risk and compliance departments who really are being pushed by their portfolio managers to better understand how these assets work. And would just add to what you're saying, I think also the level of understanding and the level of sophistication and the conversations that are being had in that part of the pyramid is a completely different game than it was two or three years ago. Oh, and Two or three years ago, like, you know, your table stakes knowledge around these things would end up being pretty low and you'd be doing a lot of education around like, what is a blockchain? How does a blockchain work? Why is it valuable? Now the questions are generally, at least in my experience, much more sophisticated from that segment of the market. It, it looks more like what I would have expected in terms of 
you know, issuer due diligence and questions about product structure and questions about, you know, expected returns on a specific asset or even like a relative assessment between, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum or another alt and, you know, questions around staking versus mining. It's a much more nuanced conversation rather than like, hey, can you tell me what Bitcoin is again? Um, and I think that's another major shift in the institutional part of the market. It, it's not just demand for assets and actual entry into the market, both in terms of trading physical assets or trading um, any of the package products built off of it, whether that's CTPs or futures or something else. Um, I think you are also seeing just a general increase in the base level of understanding in that part of the market, which to me um, would indicate the beginning we're still in the early days of adoption there as well like i think but it's a wildly different conversation than the one we were having you know 18 months ago let alone three years ago now in a, in a portfolio context i am or if i were an institutional investor i'd be interested in uncorrelated assets or an asset that is not correlated or even negatively correlated with other assets thereby increasing the robustness of my portfolio. Uh, Raphael, what does your research show? Does Bitcoin or do cryptocurrencies as, a, as an asset class, if you want to call it that, do they play that role? Can they play a portfolio diversification role? Yeah, I think they can definitely play that role. And actually, if you, if you do the calculations, you, you might even find, and, and if you go to a crypto allocation of around 3%, that that might even decrease um, the volatility of your portfolio while, while improving returns um, in some cases. So um, it's not all black and white just because crypto is volatile. It can still be a great portfolio diversifier. Now, um, about the question whether it's uncorrelated, I think uh, that's one that um, people started talking more about um, during the COVID crash in March 2020 uh, when Bitcoin picked up the quite a strong beta to the overall uh, market indices. And, um, but I would say over a long time horizon, you still have a fairly uncorrelated market. And I think that's because of, um, of the holder structure that you have in Bitcoin. It's not the same holders yet. Um, you have many people that sit on, on uh, thousands or tens of thousands of Bitcoin that have been early adopters and have maybe only crypto in their portfolio and therefore they, they make different decisions than maybe somebody uh, like an asset manager that has his risk risk constraints and then also needs to decide yeah do we want to de-risk here do we need to rebalance and so on so i think that's um that's where it comes a little bit from this this uncorrelated nature i would expect this to change um as institutional adoption also grows but for now i, I think it's still um it's still a viable uh, solution to look at if you're looking for a portfolio diversifiers. Um, I have the impression, just looking from afar, I have the impression that the price of Bitcoin is like the Nasdaq or Tesla on steroids, basically high beta in both ways, high beta up and high beta down. Um, Raphael, you, Raphael, you clearly say, no, it, it does have diversification effects and it does have um, on correlated effects. Stefan, would you agree with that? Is that what you see too? Uh, I think I think probably what you're referring to is uh, the strong retail presence that we've had in the market for the last year. And I think it's it's correlated assets that should not necessarily be correlated. But you're, you're right in the sense that the NASDAQ has kind of been the poster child for risk on and, and everything. So I definitely think given the structure that we've had and obviously everyone's been somewhat stuck at home for about a year. So you have a lot more participants in the market. You know, you had all kinds of stories of how, how much retail money that was coming in and, you know, Robin Hood and so on. So I think the correlation with the Nasdaq probably comes a little bit more from that. Um, but you could also see a correlation sort of with the dollar, probably an inverse correlation. You can see some correlation sometimes with gold um, depending on the day. So, I don't think the Nasdaq is the only one. We we do kind of this sort of analysis on a day to day basis, and it's continuously changing. So that therefore, I kind of agree with Raphael that, yeah, it might be the Nasdaq today, but uh, but not always. <laughs> Obviously, this this volatility issue, especially of, of having seen in the past few weeks when Bitcoin went from sixty five thousand down to thirty, and now we're at forty ish again. Um, 
in your view of Philia, is that basically just growing pains uh, while growing up, while um, um, being more widely used also among more, let's say, serious investors and not just a, a meme uh, trading crowd? Do you, do you expect the volatility to dissipate uh, in, in the medium term to, to grow slower or, or more less extreme? So I think that's a very complicated question to answer because ultimately to answer that question, you sort of have to look at the, the market fundamentals here. And I think as you do have larger holders and more institutional holders come into the market, they will help stabilize the market as they make up a larger percentage of the total assets that are part of, you know, that, that more liquid part of the float, right? A, a big trend in crypto broadly is this idea of like hodling, right? So people love diamond hands emojis and, and that narrative around, you know, buy it now, don't plan on touching it for a decade. Um, and I think as you have a combination of more institutional, larger holders helping to stabilize the market and that sort of long-termism in terms of how people are buying assets, the combination of those two things with a pretty positive macro environment for crypto between a lot of what's happening geopolitically, globally, a lot of what's happening with global monetary policy, um, people looking for returns, people having a little bit more risk appetite, more active involvement in trading. I think it will, in the long run, end up stabilizing some of the volatility that we're seeing. Um, but I think that that comes with the sort of natural maturation of the market and this positive macro environment. What we have seen, uh, sometimes I think Elon Musk have, must have so much fun uh, basically shooting Dogecoin to the moon one day and then uh, uh, letting Bitcoin crash by 20% or so and then letting it come up again. My question really is, uh, uh, maybe to Townsend, this um, this phenomenon that an individual like Elon can basically just manipulate the price so much by mobilizing a crowd, um, how, how should we deal with that? Or does that worry you? I mean, it's a, as Stefan was saying, the market market structure for a lot of markets has changed with the introduction of a broader of more access from retail investors with some of the gamification that occurs, you know, even among self um, self directed XO only style investors. What is what is happening with the Robin Hoods or the free trades of the world and the access people have is has really fundamentally fundamentally changed the market. I think, I mean, personally speaking. It's unfortunate that Bitcoin or any asset responds to the messages of, of, of a single person, although I sort of put it in the context of what people, in my opinion, look when they look at Bitcoin or digital assets is sort of the overall adoption trend. And I think Elon Musk represents a very significant voice in that adoption trend. And so when he and others make those statements, it starts to either create support or concern around that. And so that to some extent, it's not unjustified because clearly I think they've sort of become a proxy for, okay, you know, what are significant players who might signal adoption saying? And I don't think, you know, Elon Musk obviously is the only voice in terms of both support and resistance around where adoption is going. I think, you know, that also plays into what governments are saying and what regulators are saying. And, and overall, I think the market continues to look at kind of milestones and adoption as a way of, of kind of understanding the acceptance and sort of beginning to think about the pricing and that path to stability that, that Ophelia was talking about. So he has become somewhat a very prominent voice in that, but which is not necessarily a, a, a bad thing per se that people look to that. But ideally over time, we'd have multiple voices really and multiple milestones signaling where adoption is going, which will give investors a better opportunity to kind of gauge pricing for, for digital assets point out something that was not new at all, but he pointed out that Bitcoin uh, uses huge amounts of energy. Uh, and it's a fair point. It's, again, not new at all, but um, a point that while we are talking about global warming and, and trying to, to, uh, to have a more efficient use of energy, now we have Bitcoin using these insane amounts of energy. Uh, Stefan, in, in your view, um, 
A, is that an overblown uh, worry? Or B, uh, what could be the solution to that? So, um, I, you know, you hear it a lot, but I think for a direct comparison. So I think if you factored in the amount of employees and the amount of energy that all the sort of banking or the, the existing network takes into account, you know, you have ATMs obviously running 24 hours all across the world, several on a high street. Most of those have a lit kind of, you know, interface and so on. So I think you really have to compare it like for like and take into account, you know, what, what do we currently produce and what do we currently consume for electricity and energy to keep our current system alive. And then I think you won't see it as such a, a humongous number. What I like as well with, with Bitcoin is that people are directly accountable in, in the price. So as, as you get more sophisticated entrants into the market who can, you know, who can operate with less consumption or more sort of renewable consumption, then obviously their margin is going to increase because they're paying less every day on electricity. So naturally, I think Bitcoin will develop into a very efficient use of energy. I think at the moment we're going through those teething pains because obviously you have very cheap energy in sort of emerging and frontier markets and very little restriction around how to use that energy. So it's the consumption is astronomic in certain parts. But I do think there will be a solution to this problem and I definitely think it's overblown. Um, I think later in this panel, we're going to discuss uh, proof of stake. So obviously, from a technology standpoint, there's also solutions around, you know, scaling the network and making it more efficient. So there are there are definitely, you know, things in the works at the moment. Raphael, would you agree with Stefan's statement that it's that the energy issue around Bitcoin is is overblown? I mean, I see your point, Stefan, that uh, compared, it's not that much. It's about Sweden. But still, I mean, aren't there ways to not having it so energy intensive, uh, Raphael? Well, I think, um, so, so first of all, the people that are, are most concerned about this usually um, didn't spend too much time looking into what value Bitcoin actually provides. And then I fully agree with uh, Stefan that you should look at uh, at the alternatives. So if you just look at gold mining and, and the negative externalities that that provides, um, then you already see that, uh, that the comparison is actually not looking that bad for Bitcoin. And then about the Bitcoin mining ecosystem itself, um, the, the role that Bitcoin miners fulfill uh, or could fulfill in the, in the future of our energy grids is also uh, quite poorly understood, I think. Um, because Bitcoin miners are uh, buyers of last resort for, for, for the energy that's, uh, that's maybe uh, produced in excess, for example, in China and so on, um, because they will just move wherever it's most profitable for them. Um, so, but, but I do think, it, I mean, of course, it is a lot of energy and you cannot say anything about the, these numbers. Um, it's pretty clear how much it approximately uses. Um, so I don't think that there will be a, a future in which there are uh, multiple proof of work chains, but I do think that there is room for one. And um, uh, I think the whole the whole topic is is now, of course, with Elon Musk tweeting about it again. Um, it's coming a little bit uh, to people's minds, also with institutional investors looking at uh, is this actually um, compatible with our ESG principles. Um, so that's where I, where I think also proof of stake has a chance to to uh, take a bigger hold of the market, um, but. Overall, I would say uh, there's uh, there's a lot of information needs still in this sector, and um, in the end, I think there will be a, a a place for Bitcoin mining also in the future. Uh, it has been mentioned uh, Ethereum is in the process of moving from proof of work to uh, proof of stake, probably happening at the end of this year or early next year. Um, Ophelia, is 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 that a way forward? Could that be a solution for the for the energy issue, also for other cryptocurrencies? So I think a, a lot of crypto assets look at proof of stake. A lot of crypto assets already use proof of stake. Um, I think it, it's certainly a less, both energetically and computationally, less intensive way of performing validations. And I think there's a lot of promise in that technology um, in terms of scalability of blockchains, both in terms of energy consumption, which is what we're currently talking about, but also more broadly. Um, I think if you're going to focus on energy consumption, staking is, is part of the solution there. But I also think 
the other parts of this are really one understanding what the energetic mix of most of these miners are because it, there's a question as to where are you getting your power what is the real carbon footprint here which is ultimately what people seem to be pretty focused on and the other thing that i think both staking and proof of work have that really no one spends much time talking about yet is that esg angle right esg angle is not exclusively about well you know, what's the carbon footprint of this investment? There are other facets to this as well. And while I think proof of stake certainly helps with that energy intensive element, um, I think it's neither here nor there. I think it's pretty neutral when it comes to a lot of the other factors that make crypto investing fairly compatible with um, an ESG strategy or portfolio. I agree with you, Ophelia. What I see and hear, though, is many investors, especially institutionals, they just want to tick the box and say, OK, carbon, foot, carbon footprint checked. And with that in mind, uh, very often they say, I, I can't do crypto or I can't do Bitcoin, at least. Exactly, because they need to check the box of the, of the CO2 uh, footprint. Well, I think that so I was actually just discussing this this morning. I, it's really difficult right now to estimate CO2 footprint of Bitcoin as a concept. That's a very difficult thing because while it's possible, depending on what hardware, like what physical computers you're using to do proof of work, it's possible to estimate at least on average what the energetic consumption of Bitcoin as a network is. But it's possible. It's, it's still an area for study because people use all sorts of different computers to do this. And you may or may not know what everyone is actually using. And how do you really validate that specific computer, that specific setup that ran this on a decentralized basis? How much energy did it use to approve this? Um, it's an area where people are spending a lot of time. There's some really interesting work coming out of the University of Cambridge right now around this, actually trying to compute energetically, you know, kilowatt hours. How much energy is really being used here is still, I think, an open question. Um, specifically because of the nature of decentralization and blockchain. If you add to that, if I take that same piece of mining hardware and I run it in Iceland versus if I run it in China versus if I run it in, you know, next to a hydroelectric dam versus whether I run it in an area with like significant amounts of like dirty coal power, you're going to have massively different carbon footprints. So it, it's a little bit difficult to say, oh, well, the carbon footprint of Bitcoin is X and therefore it won't meet my requirements. That, that's something that even I think practitioners currently are spending a lot of time thinking about how to quantify that. And there's a lot of research still to be done there in terms of actually understanding it fully, especially from a carbon perspective. Um, I think that's an element that's sort of missing. And if you take that and compare it to, I think, global banking and, and some of the topics that were just covered by, um, by Stefan and Raphael, this idea that you, you need to look at it on like for like basis, you have the same issue, right? An ATM that's being run in London and an ATM that's being run in West Virginia are going to have completely different energetic profiles. And you have very much the same problem. There's not a good estimate for what the carbon footprint of banking is for exactly the same reasons, because there's a very complicated complicated set of inputs. And we typically don't look at that and offhandedly say, well, that will never qualify for this type of investment thesis. Um, it, it seems to be a screen that we're uniquely applying to crypto, despite the fact that if you want to continue using the global banking analogy, there are parts of the world where people may or may not have access to actual banking services. There are, you know, um, women in places where property laws for women are not really well respected or well established. And this gives them access to, you know, owning their own resources, which has impacts on women's education, on domestic violence, on all sorts of other things that are societal goods. And it's quite difficult to lump all of this together, especially given that both the comps and the both energetic and carbon intensity of blockchains themselves are so poorly understood. Point taken. Uh, there's a question from the audience on this issue of, of computing power. Um, does the i'm reading it does the quantum computer or will the quantum computer help to solve and or upgrade the efficiency of crypto mining anyone the uh, anyone have a view on uh, or any expertise on that topic well, oh, yeah rafael sure. um so i the way the bitcoin mining works is that if, if you have more efficient computers um, uh, that, that that can just solve this puzzle faster, then it will the puzzle itself will become uh, harder. 
So uh, just if you have uh, some very powerful uh, quantum computer that could actually do this, um, that's not going to solve the issue all on its own. I think that would even uh, increase its energy usage. Um, but quantum computers in general, I mean, this, it's, it's a topic that, that everybody always likes to bring up. Yeah, but what happens if, they, if, if Bitcoin is uh, somehow hacked with a modern quantum computer? But uh, I always say, well, if, if a quantum computer manages to hack Bitcoin, uh, then we have other problems in the world because then all encryption in the internet or a large part of it is actually in trouble. Um, and on the other hand, just on a side note, quantum computing might actually uh, be beneficial um, for the whole blockchain crypto space. Because one thing that uh, quantum computers can provide to you is uh, true randomness. And uh, that turns out that that, uh, that is quite a useful feature to have in various applications also of the technology. If, if we shift topic, one uh, hot topic is uh, central bank digital currencies. So not, not uh, decentralized cryptocurrencies, but central bank issued digital currencies. Uh, the People's Bank of China is, is pretty far on that, but many other central banks have announced plans to issue or to launch projects around the uh, central, bank, central bank digital currencies. Uh, Townsend, is that a field that will grow parallel to the cryptocurrency world? It, will that at some point become a competitor or is that enabling each other, those two worlds? I think the CBDCs point to obviously the adoption of the technology, which is again, if you look back at the idea of a roadmap milestone of, of, of things that point to further adoption, which ultimately will help um, support the, the thesis that you know this technology is here to stay and that um, the digital digital assets are valid asset classes in their own right. Yes, I don't think though in terms of investment dollars, if someone has a choice of investing in the CBDC or Bitcoin, that's really going to be a kind of a dichotomy that the investors we speak to would would suffer. I think that you know those CBDCs will kind of fulfill a very different role, um, and I don't see them as you know breaking outside the the the, the fiat issues, you know, the centralization, the central bank issues that are driving many people to look at Bitcoin as or other digital assets as stores of value. So I think it's 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 a good sign in terms of the overall adoption of the ecosystem. But I don't think personally that it will be seen as a competitor or some other, you know, kind of it'll challenge for investment dollars from our perspective. I agree with that completely. I think the the it's like saying the difference between, you know, you have five Swiss francs in your wallet right now, five Swiss francs in your Revolut account and five Swiss francs in your Credit Suisse account. All of those are held in technically different formats that are all guaranteed by the government. The ones and zeros that make up your Credit Suisse account and your Revolut account may in fact actually be different systems. They may be held in different countries with different IBANs. That doesn't mean that from an investor perspective, you as the holder of your five Swiss francs really perceives much of a difference between those three things. And I don't think some of these like central bank digital currencies are going to be materially different. So if it's five Swiss francs, in your wallet at Credit Suisse at Revolut or held in a wallet by you know some banking intermediary or even you know in your own self-custodied wallet if that's going to be materially different in terms of perception versus the Swiss francs that are you know the bill in your wallet currently uh, i don't see that as really competitive at all in terms of thesis with bitcoin or with any of the other crypto assets simply because most of the thesis there is driven around you know, a political monetary policy, a cap to the total number that will ever exist, real scarcity. Um, I, none of those elements really are impacted here and they don't, they, they don't mirror in central bank digital currencies in the same way they do in other crypto assets. I see your points that CBDCs are not a competitor to cryptocurrencies. However, from the perspective of central banks, cryptocurrencies are a competitor to their fiat currencies um so if i'm the people's bank of china and i would like i i want to launch an ermb that is used um in many countries of the world i might have an interest in trying to limit um the use of cryptocurrencies at least where i can uh, where i can control it my question is and maybe to stefan do you expect central banks or governments 
to increase their pressure, their regulatory pressure, uh, to try and 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 limit the uh, uh, and, and limit the, the the cryptocurrency field. Uh, I think limit is probably a strong word. I think there's I think there's always room for good regulation. I think we just had a you know quite a quite a good chat on sort of the ecosystem and and what it means for energy consumption and electricity. Maybe a type of regulation is to say you know only miners with this sort of carbon footprint are allowed to continue to do business. That would be you know something positive for the space while while being you know a regulatory burden. Um, I agree. I don't think it's competition at all. I think. You're right in that it might drown out some of the noise for certain investors who might say, well, you know, now I've got a euro currency online. Um, what I do think is extremely positive is that crypto has changed the nature of the conversation. And I think that's huge in the sense that what you're going to get is, you know, with, with a blockchain based currency, you're going to get much more efficient sort of transactions, settlements, all of these things. I mean, I've been personally using crypto in some form or another for many, many years. And I never had to call customer service. You know, I know there is no number to call, right? If you, so I think, I think it's a, it's, it's a fact that, you know, the system's becoming a lot more efficient, which ultimately should mean that we'll pay less in fees uh, when we travel abroad or whatever it is. And I think it's also the transparency. I think it's been a big conversation the last couple of weeks. There was a, you know, a wallet that was hacked and and I think, so sorry, a ransom money. And I think they, they managed to get the money back if I, if I know the exact details. But I think that it's been good for the space in that finally, you know, the crypto was always associated with the dark corners of the web, money laundering, all sorts of criminal activity. And what's been nice, I think, is a good display to the world is, is how easily actually you can track the coins, you know. So it's it's not about living in the dark. And I think in the same way, it's going to be good to shine that spotlight back on governments to actually see, you know, to be able to audit ourselves online where our tax money is going. Right. I think everyone would like to be able to do that. You know, so I think it's it's been a very good conversation. And I think definitely it's changed the nature of you know how people perceive money and what it means to them. And I think it's it's definitely positive in both worlds. If I could just jump in there, I mean, I think I think the, the concerns about governmental bans are perhaps somewhat overblown, at least when we talk about governments that have traditionally respected property rights. And that's most of, obviously, governments in the Western side of the, uh, of the globe. I think um, in many ways, I, I always get slightly frustrated when people kind of raise that, that you know, some of the, the Asian governments like the Chinese government about possible bans being global. Um, I think, you know, it's extremely unlikely that you would see the kind of bans that would actually do away with digital assets in, in any of the Western countries. In the United States alone, I mean, there are a number of constitutional rights that would be infringed. Um, it's, you know, obviously everyone points out, and I spent years in the gold business about the time FDR, um, you know, banned gold holdings. You know, we're in a very different place constitutionally in the United States. There is something called the Fifth Amendment. There are a lot of protections people have about, and, and restrictions on government's ability to ban assets just unilaterally. Um, and I think that pretty much plays across across most of the West and, 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 you know, in particular to the clients that we, I see Ophelia and I sell to and to, um, you know, that, that Stefan trades for and Raphael speaks to, I mean, in many ways, there's a fundamental assumption that their property rights will be respect, respected and that also then I think extends additional assets. Does that mean it's comp it's not competition well, without a doubt? And I think central banks are, are looking at it and trying to understand how it fits in, what kind of role it's going to play. I think you will see regulation apply to digital assets that, applies to cash, you know, like suspicious report transactions or SARs out of the US, you'll find, you know, it gets under the Bank Secrecy Act, um, mm -hmm. transactions over $10,000 and the like, those will all begin to slowly apply to transactions, digital assets, but an outright ban where, you know, the extent of you hold an asset and I can therefore tell you now it's illegal to hold is extremely unlikely based on the jurisprudence that exists around respect for property rights. It was quite interesting, uh, just a few weeks ago, Bitcoin reacted rather um, uh, sensitively when uh, the People's Bank of China just reiterated uh, their um, their their view on cryptocurrencies, uh, a rule that was out since 2017. They just reiterated that Chinese uh, regulated financial institutions are not allowed to trade and offer services and so on. Um, Raphael, you wrote about this. Uh, the same thing happened again, and yet the price reacted uh, very sensitively again. What's your view 
on this topic of government regulation and government regulation maybe increasing and what we, what it will mean for the crypto field well i think it's it's always the question uh, uh, whether that was actually the cause why bitcoin then uh, dropped a little bit of course some people might be scared and uh, if the whole chinese market is just cut off then uh, that's uh, less buyers of course um but overall i think um yeah i can i can basically just agree um that a, a ban on cryptocurrencies is, is not very likely. Of course, uh, every country will, will want to keep its monetary sovereignty and uh, its uh, senior rights and so on. But um, there's also the, there's also just a simple question: uh, Do cryptocurrencies provide actual value in the real world? And I'm convinced that they do. And uh, we'll see more of this in the coming decade of how this whole uh, industry actually fits in with the rest of uh, of the world. And once you once you start to realize this, um, then it just becomes a, a game theoretical competition between countries. But uh, um, just if, if you ban it, you're you're basically outside of this whole innovation, and it's the pace of innovation in crypto is is still amazing. And that's I just don't think it's something that a country can actually afford to uh, ban completely, because then um, if this whole thing takes off and you are you banned it, you will either have to revert the ban or find some other way to join this uh, uh, this new digital uh, digital world where value is settled on, on a blockchain and not on uh, the traditional payment trails. And maybe just one more uh, one more thing on, on this whole um, how then central bank digital currencies play into this. I think it's actually um, uh, it's actually a positive for the crypto space because um, some of exactly some of these real world applications um, or maybe a bit difficult to uh, do today because you have uh, because the crypto assets are so volatile. So if you could have um, stable coins or so uh, coins that are pegged to a, a certain uh, fiat currency or uh, central bank digital currencies directly or a combination of the two, and then you can actually allow people to use um, this new digital infrastructure, uh, this new settlement infrastructure. Um, while staying within currency that uh, of the country that they typically do their accounting in, so I think overall it's a it's a net it's even a net positive, and um, it's sort of the governments starting to realize that something needs to be done and uh, catching up with this trend that has already started in the crypto world for for a few years. Ago we we saw headlines that uh, El Salvador has uh, has uh, introduced Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, Stefan, was that in you? Was that just a PR stunt by a somewhat authoritarian president, uh, or do you see that really making uh, a case which could be uh, repeated elsewhere? I think it ties into what Raphael was just mentioning, which is get in there early, right? If you if you make that move and you're the first mover advantage, you're going to get, I'm sure, quite a lot of sort of wealthy crypto enthusiasts maybe moving or planning to move, or at least basing their headquarters in El Salvador, which obviously will bring, you know, US dollars as well as, you know, crypto assets, right? So I think it's it's definitely, you know, the first mover advantage. I think uh, in the same way that you have certain countries around the world at the moment that kind of act as tax havens, right? And, and that's their kind of source of business, if you like, across the Caribbean, for example, where a lot of hedge funds are based. I think it's it's a good first move to capture what is going to be, you know, the the, the, the kind of wealthy generation, let's say, of the future, right? The, the early adopters and some people who are holding quite a lot of, you know, serious crypto cash. So um, now I think uh, you might get a few countries that follow suit, but uh, but I think it would be kind of restricted to countries in, in this sort of mold that want to attract, um, you know, more, more institutional investors, um, the cutting edge of technology, developers, obviously, is becoming a big resource as well to have developers in your country and so on. So I think it'll definitely uh, play out po positively. I have a question from the audience here. There are thousands of different cryptocurrencies and uh, every now and then uh, something new pops up. Um, we even had uh, a cryptocurrency that was uh, once a joke, a dope coin uh, going through the roof and being getting into the top 10. Um, the question really is maybe to Townsend, um, as an investor, you know, which ones should one choose? I mean, can, can, you, can you make a distinction which ones are the serious ones to, to really invest in and which one you, you can just forget? I mean, I, I somewhat 
ironically, but also seriously, I think the ones that, that have actual listed products referencing them are a good start because, and I know that I say that kind of patting myself on the back or pushing, you know, but the reality is we do do a lot of diligence on the products. We look at a wide variety of things, the robustness of the underlying, the liquidity. There are a lot of requirements to wrap these products in listed product and then to list them. I think that is for anyone kind of getting in a very good place to start to figure out where, you know, where the list of products, it's sort of a, you know, obviously I, I, people who have a lot of expertise in crisp in digital assets can explore much more detail. I think, you know, and clearly there's a lot going on in particular in DeFi and elsewhere with, you know, opportunities for yield and lending. But if, you know, if, if you were talking about someone who really was relatively new to the space, wanted to understand investment, I think some of the stuff, I think looking to listed products as sort of a proxy for Ha trusting an intermediate intermediary who's involved in kind of looking at these asset classes and doing the basic diligence and wrapping them in a product is a good place to start. Now, clearly, as you get further down that rabbit hole, there are a lot of really exciting developments. Um, and it's sort of is how long is a piece of string and how much work you want to do. You do need to put the work into it. It's like any, you know, it, you're, you're in the, the realm of individual stocks. If you want to look at it from an investment perspective, which means, you know, you're looking at, you know, financials, in this case, protocols, you're looking at how the staking works, whether you can lend it, you're looking at what your yields are. I mean, and that is all you know, really exciting stuff. Um, and you know, for those investors who are keen to do that, there are a lot of sites that, you know, um, that that help explain market cap as well as the way the the staking protocols and other yield opportunities might exist. Senior, how how and when do you uh include uh a cryptocurrency or a new cryptocurrency in your product? So we're running a pretty big product suite now, and we, we run a lot of assets and have a lot of products around a pretty wide variety of assets right now, um, ranging from you know your basics like your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, all the way through to much more exotic things like uh, Polkadot or BNB or you know Tezos, for example, um, Cardano, whatever. Um, the way we look at it, is it boils down to a few things. You've got, I think, what you would call your your actual fundamentals, which is a combination of technology. Like, what is this thing actually? How does it work? Why does it work that way? Who's behind it? Um, how that technology is being developed and why? Um, so you you look at the tech piece. You look at use cases. Like, do we see some semblance of product market fit? Some kind of adoption, especially from big institutional players in the crypto space. So for example, um, who's offering custodial services? Who are the major market participants from a trading perspective? Um, you know, we, we've had products launch before Coinbase listed them, but we did that on the back of having, you know, serious depth of liquidity from other providers who are serious in the space, especially around like the OTC markets um, in crypto, which are, you know, a, a major driver in the space. So you're looking at who's actually working with these products, who holds them in their portfolios, who's behind this. You'll often get a lot of big VCs that are engaged in the space who are also institutional and they're also doing their own version of this diligence. Um, that certainly helps provide some confidence. You've got questions around, um, and then it honestly ends up being people. So like, who's actually developing this? Who's behind it? What country are they based in? Why are they based there? Does this actually make sense? What role is the foundation expected to provide? Who are the big holders? If you, you have a really high concentration of big holders, are there any restrictions around what that might look like? Um, you end up getting into the weeds on a lot of this combination of technical diligence, what I would call like semi-corporate diligence. It's not corporate because obviously there's no corporate entity, but it's the you know, who's the people, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? What does product market fit look like? What is the long-term vision for the protocol? That that type of thing, which is like a closer corollary to what corporate diligence might look like in a traditional environment. And then the last is really market construction. And once you get comfortable with all three of those things, then you can look to bring a product to market in some way. And, you know, we've, we've done this for a number of protocols and I sort of bracket them into three categories. There are products that we think just should exist. They're great protocols with fantastic teams and we stand behind them and saying, you know, this is something that really should have a market for it and this is fantastic and we should have a product here. There are products where there's a lot of institutional demand and they're saying, okay, like we really want this exposure, help us get it, this makes sense, this makes sense for us for this reason. 
and we'll take market signals like that as part of our why we would launch a product or not. And then there's a category of products that we will just never have because we can't get comfortable on one of our pillars, right? One of the things for us isn't adding up in the right way and we won't launch products out of that category regardless of whether or not someone is asking for it. And that's uh, sort of how we split up the world, if that makes sense. And uh, protocols may change category over time, but typically that's the, the screens that we're applying up front. Right. Unfortunately, time is up and we have to wrap up. Uh, and I was told that uh, the program will close uh, rather sharply but we've we've touched many many things and we could have dig deeper into many more things uh, maybe just as a closing if if we have a few more seconds you know in terms of use cases out there because we, we all agree this is new and it's it's still finding its way but in terms of actual and tangible use cases out there which is or which are the most exciting to you right now to look at um, i'd like to start with you rafael and then and then we'll go around the clock. Um, I was the most exciting use case for me in the recent times was that um, uh, now that uh, a decentralized finance protocol was actually giving out um, or planning to give out funding um, for something to be to be built in the real world. So it would be like a 10 million uh, DAI in this case, which is uh, trading very close to a dollar, a $10 million loan for a uh, auto parts shop in some uh, somewhere in, in the US. So I think that's um, sort of this interface that I spoke about uh, earlier with the real world where actually it's not just all this, um, uh, this crypto space staying within itself, but also reaching out in the real world or making an impact. And then on the other hand, um, you have um, examples like um, South America or Africa where already now people that were previously unbanked um, could, can now have sort of a banking account that even gets a little bit of yield um, on their phones. So, so I think those are the, the major exciting developments um, if you want to talk a big, uh, big picture. Thank you, uh, Townsend. Next. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think obviously the world of DeFi, and, and again, it is it is a very complex world, and anyone looking into it has to understand it completely. But is is some really exciting opportunities. Um, for those who understand it, it is, like I said, you know, caveat again, very complex, but some of the yield opportunities and the lending opportunities, you know, whether it's kind of staking or actually getting involved in lending is 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 probably some of the most innovative stuff in finance in the last 25 years, um, you know, and really, um, I mean, the way it's the, the speed at which it's it's developing and increasing is is dramatic and, and quite, quite, I mean, it's fascinating, I guess, from, from my perspective. Thank you, Stefan. Next. Yeah, no, I think uh, Ethereum. I know it sounds basic, but I think uh, it's kind of the pioneer and the technology that runs. I'd say maybe I don't want to venture a guess, but sixty to seventy percent of the other coins at the moment. I think it's unbelievable technology. Obviously, first mover advantage, and then to echo everyone else, I think Defi. Uh, a lot of it built on Ethereum is is incredible, and then the automated market making space as well. The automated liquidity provision, obviously. That's directly going to put me out of business. So it's something that I need to keep an eye on. But, you know, if you saw how much effort we put and how many developers and, you know, high frequency systems and all of that, just to get to a place where we can quote on an exchange, when you hear that some people are doing it completely black box sitting on <laughs> Amazon cloud, it does get you a little bit worried. So I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a space that I'll, I'll be watching. And uh, obviously it's, it's close to my heart. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, Ophelia, you get the last word. Oh, um, I think everything people have mentioned already, just to not, I agree with wholeheartedly with all of it. I, I have a, a mild obsession with automated market makers. I think they're a fascinating new development um, broadly for the world. But just to pick something a little bit different for the sake of adding something to the conversation, um, one of the things I'm most excited about is bridging on-chain and off-chain transactions. Some of what um, companies like Chainlink are doing bringing data that exists in the real world into a blockchain environment in a way that's trustless so you don't have to have um you don't have to have a centralized point of failure for data you can actually have real world data in a blockchain without needing it to be centralized is pretty incredible and is going to be a major driver of our ability to do things like DeFi and automated market makers going forward 
the advancements that are happening in terms of data architecture are incredible and are ultimately going to provide a key backbone to all of the services that are being built on top of Ethereum networks and, and more broadly also um, layer two networks designed to reduce gas costs. So just to add a slightly different perspective, that's one of the things I'm very excited about. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I, I would love to go on for longer, but we have to come to a close. First of all, thank you very much for joining us, Raphael, Townsend, Stefan, and Ophelia. Thanks for sharing your insight. Uh, thanks for Six uh, and Andre to make this happen. And thank you all in the audience for uh, having been with us. Uh, now my uh, job is just to wish you all a great day, a great evening. Uh, be safe, be well, and uh, hope to see you all again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay,